We're playing checkers, one jump at a time. They're playing chess. Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth on Now You Know. Now, do you remember when Japanese cars hit American shores in the late 70s? Oh, right. How could you? I mean, you weren't even born yet. So what happened? Okay, well, I was just a kid, but I remember all of a sudden there were these little cars with funny names that popped up all over the place. Like what? Like Hondas, Toyotas, Datsuns. I mean, didn't Datsun turn into Nissan? Mm -hmm. Aren't these cars we're all familiar with? Why, why are you talking about this? Well, it seems like something that's about to happen again. Oh, right. Like Teslas are popping up everywhere. Um, not exactly. I was thinking more like Chinese cars. I don't see any Chinese cars in America. How about Volvo and Polestar? Those are Swedish. Are they? Because last time I checked, Volvo was owned by Geely, and Geely is a Chinese auto manufacturer. But I think EVs are the future. So do you think that Polestar is going to steal the market away from American, Japanese, and European big auto? Well, I think Chinese auto companies are actually further along with EV technology than most other countries. And I think China could repeat what Japan did back in the 80s. I think China is coming. And I'm not the only one. We interviewed Sandy Monroe, an expert with decades of experience in worldwide manufacturing. We'll hear what he has to say after a word from our sponsors. We are giving away a 2022 Tesla Model Y performance. Well, we aren't. Charity Stars is. <laughs> That's right. And you can win the Model Y and $10,000 in cash by going to charitystars.com slash now you know and get this. What? If you use the code now you know at checkout, you'll get 250 free entries on your purchase. The Tesla Model Y performance is an amazing car with a top speed of 155 miles an hour, over 300 miles of range, 0 to 60 in just 3.5 seconds, 21 inch Uber turbine wheels, and the all glass roof. Are you kidding me? I love the Model Y. Me too. Charity Stars is a groundbreaking fundraising platform that helps raise money for charitable causes. And the cause that you're supporting by going to charitystars.com slash now you know is the Jamie Kimball Foundation for Courage, a charity whose mission is to create a future without intimate partner violence. So head over to charitystars.com slash now you know, help a great cause and enter for your chance to win this amazing prize, the Tesla Model Y Performance and $10,000 cash. And don't forget to use our code now you know when checking out to get 250 additional free entries and increase your chances of winning. And get this, taxes and shipping are included for US winners. Good luck. Elon keeps promising waypoints, but last time I checked, they weren't in my car. But they could be in your car using a better route planner. Check out our link down below for a 30-day free trial to the premium app. There's also a free version. And we're sponsored by EcoWare. If you like the t-shirts we're wearing on the show, you can get those at EcoWare along with a hundred other designs. And you don't have to just get t-shirts. We got everything from pillows to shower curtains to pet wear. And we carbon offset the manufacturing, the shipping, and the life cycle of everything that we sell. And in addition to that, we plant 10 trees. And in addition to that, we help to cap abandoned methane spewing oil wells with our friends at the Well Done Foundation. Don't forget to use our promo code holiday season to save 15% off your purchase at EcoWare. Well, we're so fortunate to have Sandy Monroe with us right now. Uh, we have some questions for you, Sandy. We're talking about China coming. And this kind of reminds me of the 80s with Japan. I remember all of a sudden, all these Japanese models were on the market. A lot of Americans were like, what is Nissan? What is Honda? They seem like joke cars. And yet they took over the market. Do you remember back in the 80s, like what was the car that was most impactful to you, the brand that was most impactful as the Japanese car market started to ramp up here in America? I remember everything crystal clear because <laughs> I was your age then. <laughs> The Japanese invasion happened really quickly, much faster than anybody could possibly imagine. And I was working at Ford at that time. Ford had a real miserable time trying to put out a small car that wouldn't fall apart, you know, on your way to the, uh, to the drugstore. These vehicles were absolutely pure crap. They had taken the um, MBA philosophy, if you like, to the max. And what they were doing was anything that got out the door was good to sell. And, uh, and profit, well, we're gonna make our profit on spare parts. When I was at Ford, I listened to a speech from Henry II, Henry the Deuce is what they called him there, and he said, the Japanese can have the small car market. We don't need it, we don't want it. Let them have it, they'll, they'll never make any money at it, and they'll never understand the big car market or the luxury car market or the pickup truck market. 
and sitting right next to him, right beside him, was Lee Iacocca, because he was still there at the time. What I remember was seeing the very first Toyota live and in person. So I had a Morgan Supersport, and it was a really fast English hand-built sports car, and I was racing it and things like that. And I pulled into the parking lot. I was working as a tool maker, pulled into the parking lot at uh, Valiant Machine Tool, and a guy pulled in next to me. And I looked at it and I said, what in the world is that? He says, I just bought it and it was like, my, my car, let's say was X. This, this, uh, this Toyota was probably one-tenth X. And I said, how do they make it so cheap? And he says, I don't know, but, uh, but I bought it and blah, blah, it works good and yak, yak, yak. And I looked around and I said, Can I, do you mind if I look underneath? And I looked underneath and it had a chain drive. This was one of the very first uh, Toyotas that came across, it was a chain drive. I said, you're an idiot, this thing will never last. Some of the car companies had already entered the market but under motorcycle names. So, uh, and you meet the nicest people on a Honda, you know, Solo Suzuki. There was a ton of, uh, a ton of different, um, different products that they brought into the market. First thing they did was gobble up the motorcycle market, which was dominated by the English. And that disappeared in like, it seemed like seconds, but it was probably something like uh, a, a few years. And then their cars started showing up. Now I was, you know, I was like two or three years and now I was at Ford. And I'm telling you what, they devastated. They mopped the floor with the American car companies. At that time, in that era, 50, 55% of the market belonged to General Motors alone. 24, 25% was, uh, was Ford, and, and Chrysler had 12 or 15%, something like that. Now it's like ridiculously small. I think uh, General Motors is like 18, 16, 18%, something like that. Amazing. And that all happened within five or six years. Between the oil embargo and the fact that gasoline was hugely expensive, it went from like a quarter a gallon to the two bucks. People were trying to get out of their, their big fat cars faster than you could believe. And nobody wanted to drive a pickup truck, nobody. So the, this was a cultural and economic change that happened and we're in exactly the same situation now. Here we are again. 35 years later, and it's in exactly the same same situation. Yeah, I was going to ask you, it seems so similar that um, now EVs are more efficient than gas cars, so they save you money. And the quality, a lot of people kind of laugh at Chinese brands, kind of like they laughed at Japanese brands when they first came. So do you think this is kind of a repeat? Oh, I'm positive. Like, I've been working with the Chinese for the last five years. So three months of the year, I was in China uh, working on um, the design of, of new cars. So they built a tremendous number of, uh, of vehicles. So in 2018, 27 million cars were made in China. And this year, they're expecting somewhere around 24 million. If we look at the United States, uh, we sell about 17 million in 2018. In 2021, we'll be lucky to do uh, 14, maybe 15 million. Remember, these guys have been making cars at a ferocious rate. They know what a good car has to look like in order to make a sale. Now what they've done is they, they don't want to have the, uh, the old American masters. So a lot of these cars, like uh, if, you look at, uh, if you look at the car sales in, in China, almost all of the big car companies like Cadillac or whatever, they're all represented in that 24 or 25 million vehicles. They're all big, they're at the top of the, top of the line. So you've got GM and, and Volkswagen and all of the big names all sitting up there at the top. Well, now they're making their own cars. And all these big car companies that have been building basically American cars, well, we're gonna build our own Chinese cars and they're gonna be only electric because they have no desire to get into the, uh, into the ice world. What happens when these start hitting California? I mean, California's gonna see it first. It's just gonna be the same as, as, uh, as Japan. And quite frankly, California doesn't have allegiance to a, a car company. It's not like Detroit or something like that. They, uh, they have an allegiance kind of to, uh, to Tesla, 
But for the most part, Californians don't care about what they care about is what does it look like? Is it, uh, is it friendly to the uh, environment? Is it a good price? On and on. They have a totally different perspective and they don't really care about Buy American because a lot of people have a lot of different ethnicities in California, there's no World War II guys left over. My dad never, not in a million years, would ever buy a Japanese car. He was in World War II, he had his own little experiences and his own, we don't have that, we've never been to, to war with China. So that t part of the population is gone and really there's nothing to replace it. When I, when I said that the crossover point was gonna be 2028 uh, for ICE to, uh, to EV, I wasn't kidding. And this is what I've got in the back of my mind. A lot of those cars are gonna be Chinese and they are gonna come in in wave after wave after wave after wave. And the guys here cannot say no. If the US government says no, then China will nationalize all of the plants that, that, uh, that all the foreigners are building at in China and they'll instantly go bankrupt because most of their profit now is coming from the China market, not from the US market. So I see a tidal wave of problems coming that uh, obviously the rest of the world doesn't see. I don't know how they could miss this. Maybe it's just because I'm old, but I'm telling you, there's a, there's a, a, a storm tsunami that's coming that is gonna make, uh, make the Japanese, and people will forget when the Japanese came after this. So let me just ask. So, you know, Chinese car manufacturers right now are focusing on EVs. They're making pretty decent EVs. But what about safety? I mean, like people really care about safety and we think, you know, cars made in China, we're used to the stuff that you buy at Walmart made from China. We're not built to last and it'll kill you if you get in an accident. Is that, do you think that's going to be true? No, it can't be true because they have to go through all the testing and whatnot, testing and validation that basically the Department of Transportation um, puts out. So NISHTA, the insurance companies will crash those cars. Everybody is gonna, and then we've got uh, consumers reports and everything. Remember, shortly after Toyota came in, they went to the top of consumers reports. J.D. Powers gave them all kinds of five-star ratings and whatnot. They're gonna come in as a really well-built car and it'll be, they'll be electric. They won't, they're not gonna bring in any gas vehicles, none. So that means that the EPA is totally out of, the, out of business. Now you've worked in China at factories, like you said, for months and months at a time. You've seen the inside of these factories. What are they doing differently than American companies are doing? Cause I mean, GM, they've got the Ultium battery platform. They're, they're you know, fully embracing EVs, they say. So why aren't uh, American car companies gonna be able to compete? Okay, well, I don't want to get into chemistries and big decisions that GM and Ford are making, but I can tell you right now that battery technology is changing at a pretty rapid clip, and they've decided to standardize on a battery that I think is right now obsolete, let alone in the five years it's going to take them to put the battery plant up. The testing and validation that, that needs to happen is significant, and, and to change that on the fly, that's just not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. So I think that the big car companies didn't like to listen. So this isn't brand new. I mean, in 2018, I was making noises about, hey, you know what, you guys better pay attention to what's going on. In 2019, when I did my round the world thing, I'm telling you what, who is booing? Not the Chinese not the guys in Singapore or the guys that were in Norway or even in Britain. Oh, it would be the Japanese, the Americans, and the Germans. They booed. They, ah, that's ridiculous. You're, you got it out of your mind. You don't know shit. You're not a real car guy. Okay, well, let me hear them now. Well, let's see. A couple of those guys in Germany, they went to jail for Dieselgate, among other things. I'm pretty sure I'm right. In fact, um, a lot of people are, um, are banking on what I have to say as being uh, the truth. And I'm thinking right now that there's a tremendous amount of problems associated with the strategic uh, business direction that some of these people are taking. And I don't think they're hedging their bets nearly well enough. China is not going to be producing a crap car. And they know it. They know it because they've got 
They've got their vehicles in China. They know what their warranty costs are. They know how well they're built. There's no way in hell that China is going to send over a bunch of junk that's going to fall apart on the shores. These aren't going to be Yugos. Not at all. These are going to be built just like a European car. And because that's what they use is European standards. And most of the guys that I bump into uh, when I'm in China, most of the foreigners um, are German or French or Italian or British. Well, I haven't bumped into too many Americans over there that are into manufacturing, but I bump into a lot of the guys from BMW or Mercedes that I know, or like uh, PSA, Poussin Citron, or... Uh, Land Rover, Range Rover, those kind of guys. Yeah, that's who I bump into over there, and tons of them. Design, as in styling, engineering, and manufacturing. When do you think we're going to see the first real Chinese competitor hit U.S. soil? I mean, what brands do you think will be first? My guess would be Shanghai Automotive, NIO, uh, Beijing EV. Well, you've already, you got Volvo, that's Geely, okay? Geely is, is here already. Okay, so Trump put something in place to try and block the Chinese, and they'll put up with that for a while, but sooner or later, they're gonna play their ace card. Either you let us in, or we're nationalizing all your car plants. And you know who's gonna say, oh, wait a minute, we can't do that. That's gonna be GM and Ford, BMW, Mercedes, and especially VW. VW makes a load of money over there. They're gonna be going to the government and saying, hey, you, you got to do this. You, you got you to gotta let us, um, let them in so we can continue to make all this big money. You can't shut us down. It'll kill us all. So again, this is the difference between American business and definitely Chinese business. We're playing checkers one jump at a time. They're playing chess. It's like a really, really good movie where you have no idea what they're going to do next. And then you say, oh, they planned for it up here to do that. Unless you're a big fan of the art of war, if that's your business plan, uh, is, is geared toward the art of war, you'll win. If it's just, oh, we're going to do this. Oh, we're going to catch up to Tesla by 2025. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. No kidding. Where did that come from? I'd like to see the strategic plan. That that, most guys have a plan that'll last a quarter. That's it. Do you think Chinese companies will start buying brands like you just mentioned, uh, Geely's, you know, bought Volvo, MG's bought by a Chinese company, Lotus, even Pirelli has been bought by a Chinese company. Do you think they'll do that so that it kind of hides their moves more? Um, if they can get something for a bargain, they'll take it. MG badge came for free, basically, and that was Shanghai Automotive. They got that for next to nothing. And Volvo, I mean, Ford couldn't get rid of that fast enough. They could not make any money at it. Same thing with Tata buying Range Rover or Land Rover. They couldn't make a penny at it, and now all of a sudden it's rolling in dough. And Jaguar, another good example, right? All these different badges, they don't seem to work under U.S. management. And the reason for that is because of the short-sighted, you know, checker kind of moves. The only place that Americans can really make a tremendous amount of money, American car companies, is right here. And even that is dwindling. The Chinese, they loved the imported American cars. Then they went over there. The long and short of it is the Chinese worker really wants to work. I mean, it's like a source of national pride. I can't uh, put into words how these guys like to work and how they, they want to try and catch up and, and beat the Japanese. It's, a, it's an amazing phenomenon. That work ethic is, is going to be very difficult for anybody over here to to catch up to or exceed. Now, how does Tesla fit into this? I mean, do you think that Tesla is going to be able to succeed? Yes. This is like we're going to run a hundred yard dash and everybody's at the starting line except for Tesla. And they got one yard to run. Unless you're tearing apart vehicles every day like we are, unless you're doing that every day, you, you can't comprehend how fast these guys are moving and how far ahead they are. I, I, I'm telling you flat, it's every time we, we, what, are you kidding me? I mean, people talk about some technology and the next thing you know, it's stuck inside of a Tesla. Look at that chip that they just came up with, that, that new teraflop chip. I mean, are you kidding me? Who, who can even make this thing? Okay, so if you look at 
the original car that we took apart, the, the Model 3 we took apart, and you look at the controller board, okay, there are three uh, NVIDIA chips there, right? They designed their own chip, it went down to two. And now the next boards that come out, it'll have one. Oh, well, there's a chip shortage. Hey, you know what? Let me think about this. If I could take two thirds of the chips out of my circuit board, how much faster or better could it be? And then you look at these other ones. So you look at the chips on the different boards, right? You've got 10 millimeter chips, five millimeter chips, and now we're looking at three millimeter and in, in essence, a one millimeter chip that they're working on. Okay, if you're looking at the three and the one millimeter chips, that's where all of the guys who are making chips, that's where they wanna go. They wanna go in that direction because they can make a whole lot more money at it. But everybody else wants to buy the 10 because, well, it's old and reliable. And look, here it is, right, right here. Here's my standard. It says I have to use that 10, the 10 millimeter chip is going away. They don't want to build that. So they put it in Malaysia or Indonesia. That's where chips go to die, right? That's the chip graveyard. Well, guess what? They didn't ramp up fast enough. How many times have you heard Tesla crying about, we can't get chips? None. None. Why? Because they're not using the old style chips. They don't have many of them that they need that are even at five. There's a couple of 10 millimeter chips, but mostly are five or less. Five millimeter chips all day long out of, uh, out of Taiwan. But, uh, but those other ones, not so much. And how many chips are made here? Next to none. Why? Oh, we can get them cheaper from China. <laughs> Idiots. Here we go. I, I moved my checkers and look, I got one. Yeah. That kind of crap doesn't work. This is not an MBA market anymore. This is a general kind of market. This is a market where military designs, strategic designs, designs that have to go five years out, 10 years out. I mean, the Japanese used to have 100 years out. They used to have a 100-year plan at Toyota. Not anymore, because they went to Harvard and they found out, they do. you don't need to do that. I won't even be here in 100 years. That's kind of like what the Chinese are still doing. So then how did Tesla get so far ahead? You know, if they have American workers who, you know, don't have maybe exactly the same work ethic as uh, Chinese workers, how can they be so far ahead? Well, the easy answer, of course, is um, they have Elon Musk. Elon Musk does not have an MBA. He is a technocrat extraordinaire. He knows technology. He gets excited about new things. I, I was in a, a design review with him and I was astounded that the richest man in the world, the guy who's probably got more going on in technology than anybody else is sitting in a design review. You know how many CEOs I've seen in design reviews? None. I have seen zero CEOs ever, ever participating in a design review, ever. They wouldn't know what to say. They wouldn't know what was going on. And yet here we are talking about a rocket engine and I have worked on rocket engines and a, a lot of them and people making suggestions and Elon said something and they said, oh, come on, Elon, that, go, that won't work, blah, blah, blah. This is why a formula this long that I never heard of before. And oh, Elon says, oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Son of a, yeah, well, okay, all right, forget that. What, do, what, what else have we got? Do you know what happens when you contradict a CEO in a meeting? I mean, it's instantaneous. Your career is over, period. When you've got that kind of flow, and then what's Elon's uh, edict to his people? Chain of command is too slow. Just get the job done. Holy sh, I mean, really? I mean, this is strategic. This is like in World War II, the Polish had the best cavalry on the planet. And it's really inexpensive to feed a horse and, and, uh, and give a guy's uh, a, a pointy stick, right? the best cavalry, lancers, and yet it only took about 15 minutes for the Panzer's tanks to crush them like bugs. Why? Why did that happen? I mean, after all, they were the best in World War I, and we're only looking at maybe, you know, five, 10 years later, and here they are flattened out by a bunch of German tanks. What happened? They decided to sit still. They decided that, oh, we're very good at this. Let's just stay at what we know the best. 
And you know what we call that in MBA language? That's called core competency. Focus on core competency. It's a good idea as long as the world doesn't turn. When the world goes and stops, then core competency will work out. You'll be happy. Until then, anybody that doesn't move is a Luddite. Luddites are people who hate technology. And in 1811, uh, they started smashing looms because they saw this as taking away business from other people. You're stealing my job, so I'm gonna break your loom. I don't wanna have automation or whatever, all right? Well, guess what? That was the Industrial Revolution and um, too bad. You're gonna get left behind. And we've got a ton of people that are in the exact same position right now. And tragically, a few of them have uh, made it to positions of authority and on and on. I'm worried about the United States. I'm worried that they're, they're sitting on their hands too much. I'm worried that they're not making strategic decisions. They're making tactical decisions as a rule just to appease Wall Street or, or maybe get their name in the paper. One of the, one of the examples that came out in, in the press here in Detroit was something from John McElroy. He's kind of like a local favorite here. And he said the Tesla deal with Hertz is a giant embarrassment to the Detroit Three, okay? The traditional automakers have never seen anything like that ever before, never. And that is a good indication of what's gonna be coming down the road they just, they don't get it. They're still frozen in time. They're still frozen. In fact, I don't know if you heard, but uh, Nishta is also going after Chrysler for diesel, diesel problems. There are so many things that are, are going on that is such a dichotomy. So many things that seem to be going in the opposite direction. It's really tragic, but this is a train wreck that everybody's watching slowly. It'll unfold fairly quickly, I think, in two years, it's going to be um, it's going to be tragic. So, Sandy, I hear that there's a way that uh, fans could maybe hang out with you somehow. They're they're having an auction. The American Cancer Society is having an auction here in Detroit. It's called the um, 2021 Discovery Ball, and um, it's a formal kind of uh, thing. But there, the auction can be you can you can get to the auction via the internet if you wanna if you wanna bid on some of these different uh, different prizes that they got out. And the winner, whoever bids the highest, gets a chance to have Corey and I, and we're going to take them to lunch at a place called Lully's, which is a really nice steakhouse just down the road. We're going to give them a tour of the facility, talk about the technologies, and show them how we tear things to pieces. And, um, and then they're, they're actually going to watch uh, one of our uh, Monroe Live tapings. So... It, it's kind of like if you're, if you're into Tesla, because we're hoping that we'll have something from Tesla to tear apart, but if you're into, uh, if you're into that, and, or if you just want to you know, make a donation to the American Cancer Society, this is a great way to do it. You get something out of it. Yeah, you're going to have to outbid Jesse and I on this, so <laughs> bid high. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, oh I mean, come on. Okay. We're going to be lined up for this. Uh, yeah, we'll put the link down below. So if you're watching and you want to have a date with Sandy and get all that great stuff, uh, you can bid down below and help support the American Cancer Society. Exactly. That's awesome. And, you know, this episode we're doing now on China is uh, something that you're actually working on. I can't wait to see your upcoming episode. Tell us about what you're working on. Yeah, we've got uh, we've got three episodes that we're, we're going to try and push out. Um, one is going to be on uh, business the the changes that are going to come and we're going to talk a little bit about first off the hertz uh situation and then the insurance policy stuff that's after that and on and on and then the uh, the second one is uh, going to be basically talking about the chinese invasion and how i see it and how it'll roll out and that kind of stuff and then the third one is which oem is going to survive which ones how much are they going to survive are they going to die completely how much market share will they have? Those are the three that we're going to be looking at. If you're watching this channel right now, you already know who Sandy Monroe is. But if you don't, you have to head over to his YouTube channel, Monroe Live, and subscribe right now because this is brilliant. And Corey's not even in here. Normally, it's Corey. I, I, subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I really appreciate you guys letting uh, let me come on. I. Uh, I hope that this is a good show for you. I'm pretty sure that, uh, that you're hitting a, a message that is going to be phenomenal as a prophecy to the future. So.
And, you know, as soon as we get a hold of this damn Rivian, uh, we plan on driving it right to you so you can, uh, well, maybe not tear it apart, but at least look <laughs> under the hood. We'll be happy to tear apart, look under the hood. All right. As long as you can put it back together. I mean, I never see you put them back together, so I don't know. <laughs> oh, we put things back together. All right. All right. Then, all right. Maybe, maybe we'll let you tear it apart. <laughs> cool. All right. Good. I can hardly wait. Okay. Awesome. We can hardly wait, too. Thank you so much, Sandy, for your time today. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thank you. Wow. I really didn't expect that, to be honest. I mean, I thought Sandy would say something like, well, China will be a problem, you know, 10 years from now. But he really made a case for big auto in the U.S., Europe and Japan needing to fear Chinese auto companies in just the next couple of years. Yeah, he brought up so many good points. And since this is in depth, I think we have to go even deeper. What, what are you saying? I think we have to do a China is coming part two. That's a great idea. Because I want to know who the players are and some more numbers. And so we're going to need to put our research hats on and get to work on part two for next week. And you know why we do this? Because of our patrons. They support us over on patreon.com slash now you know. And it's their support that enables us to do this work for you week in and week out. Because let's face it, who else is going to tell you about the future of transportation? Well, a lot of people actually. Yeah, but how many of them have a track record of being right? That's a good point. We've been reporting on Tesla, EVs, and sustainable energy every week for the past five years. And we've been right so far. And that's because we're independent. We go where the facts lead, whether Big Auto or Big Oil likes it or not. How many other news sources that you know of can say that? Because if you dig a little, you'll find that most of them are supported by big industry. One of our sponsors that I want to tell you about is Henson Shaving. Yeah, it's not a giant conglomerate, but a small, family-owned company up in Canada that used first principles to solve a universal problem. How to get a great shave with a low impact on the earth and your body. Now, you might have thought that humans had solved this problem already. They did. In fact, William Samuel Henson invented the T-shaped safety razor back in 1847. The problem is that your typical safety razor still takes some skill to operate compared to a throwaway cartridge. That we all know and hate. Right. Cartridge razors are expensive, impossible to recycle, and just downright don't work properly. Right. I mean, a multi-blade cartridge is designed to pull your hair up and then cut it, which causes ingrown hairs and skin irritation. But Henson's safety razor has extremely tight tolerances, making it as easy to use as a cartridge razor without any of the waste or damage to your skin. I found that I can shave more often with this Henson shaver without my face breaking out like it used to when I was trying to squeeze the last few shaves out of my Gillette razor. With the holiday season upon us, might I suggest a wonderful gift for anyone in your life who shaves? A quality shaver that will last a lifetime. And if you use our code now you know on checkout at hensonshaving.com, they'll even throw in a hundred free blades. That's like three years of shaving for free. Save your face, save the environment, go to hensonshaving.com today. And help us keep bringing you the news that matters to you every week by heading over to Patreon and supporting us for as little as a buck a month. There you'll find tons of perks like our Patreon bonus stories, more news stories every week just for our patrons. Go check it out now. We're going to get started on China is Coming Part 2. We'll see you next week. Thanks for supporting us, everyone. Now you know. <laughs>